Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to be giving people just a couple minutes to log in here. So we'll be starting in a few minutes. Um, please hang tight and we'll begin shortly. Thank you. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining us from wherever you're joining us today. My name is Natalie Kladdick and I am a product manager here at HBS Online. I'm delighted to welcome you to our discussion today, the pandem pandemic, the economy and the markets, what it all means for alternative investments. I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance. We're definitely going to do our best to get through all of those. Um, and I also wanted to say if you have questions while you're listening, Please feel free just to drop those in the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll try and cover those as well. And then additionally, we are recording the session and we can distribute it after in case you miss anything. So before we dive in, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Randolph Cohen. Professor Cohen is one of three faculty who developed our HBS Online Alternative Investments course, which covers private equity, hedge funds, and real estate. He is a senior lecturer at the, in the finance unit at Harvard Business School and teaches investment management investment management at MIT Sloan School of Management. His research focuses on the interface between institutional investors' actions and price levels in the market, and he has helped start and grow a number of investment management firms, as well as served as a consultant to many others. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Cohen. The floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Natalie, and thanks to the whole uh, HBS online team, and of course to all of you for being here now. I should update that bio. I don't do any teaching at MIT anymore. I did teach there for a number of years, but uh, if you want to get my teaching now, you got to come to HBS uh, or uh, take um, uh, HBS online courses, uh, alternative investments. Um, so my plan is to talk about the markets first. I'm going to talk about why the market went down so fast and so much, why the market uh, came back up so fast and so much. Um, what we should expect going forward from the market broadly and also from key elements of the market. And then I want to talk a little about implications for private equity and hedge funds. Um, and I want to do that all quickly because I really want to get to your questions, which uh, some great ones have already been submitted. And of course, you should submit more questions. They don't have to have anything to do with the subjects I talk about today. You can ask me about absolutely uh, anything, anything in financial markets, anything in the economy, wh whatever you want to talk about, I'm here for you. So. Uh, in order to accomplish all that and still leave lots of time for questions, I'm going to employ a uh, pedagogical technique we use at HBS known as talking very fast, um, And uh, but uh, I'll plow through a lot, I'll repeat myself a lot, and of course the video will be available if you want to uh, double check anything I said and make sure uh, you understood it. So. Um, why did the market drop so much? Well, obviously it dropped because of COVID and the associated lockdowns uh, that, uh, that were put in all over the world um, to contain the spread of the virus. Um, but that's not the sole reason. I mean, after all, the, the U.S. market fell about 30 percent from peak to trough, uh, you know, lost, I would say, actually over a third of its value, uh, probably 35 percent. You know, <clears throat> I think most people accept that, you know, if not, if we're not, even if we're not lucky enough to have a um, vaccine or, you know, fully effective therapy by the end of this year, we'll probably have it uh, by the end of next year. 
Uh, so if you look at it, you get some economic loss for a year or two and then more or less back to normal. You know, why would that uh, lop a third off the value of the U.S. stock market? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And um, the answer is there's three things going on when you have market crashes, right? And you want to be aware of these uh, when you get into crash scenarios because crash scenarios are the easiest way to lose your money management firm or frankly your job if you're at a money management firm, but they're also the best opportunities to make money and deliver outperformance in money management. So it's worth spending a little time thinking about what happened so we're ready for the next one. After all, we've had three crashes this century, right? Three crashes since 2000. That's one every less than seven years. So, you know, I'm not saying that's the rate we're going to have them over the rest of your career. I hope not, frankly. I hope we don't see so many crashes. But if we do, uh, most of you might expect to see, you know, five or ten more crashes during your life. Uh, so it makes sense to really think about um, how they work and how to make money off them. Uh, the first thing, uh, of course, as I say, is we get a drop because of the bad economic news. Um, but that can only explain a fraction of the effect. And in fact, uh, uh, Robert Schiller of Yale won the Nobel Prize a few years ago in great part for kind of pointing this out and explaining that the movements are too large to be accounted for just by the news about the cash flows of the companies. Um, so what else is going on? Well, the second big factor is that people become more risk averse in difficult times and essentially they say, all right, um, you know, I might under normal circumstances be happy to buy stocks if they're going to outperform bonds by 3% a year. Um, but right now in these difficult, uh, scary, panicky times, I'm going to demand a higher expected return from stocks uh, of, of some amount, right? And, and so that causes, um, if you think about a discounted cash flow model of uh, valuing uh, the stock market as a whole or any individual company, you'll see that the higher a return people want on it in the future, um, the lower the price has to be today, right? In other words, so not only are the future earnings from the company lower, but uh, you're demanding a higher return. And so you say, I need to buy it cheap, cheap, cheap in order to be worthwhile. So that's the second factor that drives markets down in a crash. Um, and then there's a third factor. And that is, and that's, that's a big change actually um, over the last uh, generation of the markets. Even if you go back to the tech wreck of 2000, um, market went down slowly. You had months and months to see that the tech bubble was collapsing. And then after it hit bottom, you had months and months to see that it was heading back up and to make money off buying. In 2008, we had a pretty rapid crash, um, but on the way back up, you had years where you could have bought in and made a lot of money. But look at this most recent crash. The market went, you know, started the year around 3,200, uh, went as high as 3,600, crashed all the way down to about 2,300 or below. Um, and now it's back to 3,200 where it started the year. And so it's all happened in, in sort of the blink of an eye. There was very little time to move. And what's really been a key there, I actually have a paper on this called They Built a Second Bomb. What we show is there is a ton, a ton of money in the markets in strategies that are trend following strategies. So whenever the market's dropping, they automatically sell. And whenever the market's going up, they automatically buy. Okay. Now, this has an enormous effect when you have dramatic movements, when you have big drops, and then you have a group of people that say, oh, you know, and, and when I say people, think computer programs that say, oh, if the market's dropping, we have to automatically sell. And by the way, they're not doing that because they think the market's going to fall further. They're doing that to protect the downside. If you have a pension fund and you're like, look, we can afford to lose 10% of the money in the fund, but we can't afford to lose 20%, then when the market starts dropping, you need to sell. And that's true even if you know that you're probably selling at a low price. You still just have to do it because you can't afford to take the risk um, of having, having a massive hit to the whole portfolio. Or you're not going to be able to pay out um, you know, the, the people's retirement benefits. It's a, it's a total nightmare. So you're forced to buy this, what they call portfolio insurance. And that basically involves selling on the way down. Um, so when you have first bad economic news hitting the market, then an increase in risk aversion causing the market to drop even more. And then you have these trend followers pushing the market down even further. And actually there's even a new kind of tr trend following strategy called risk parity that's increasing the effect even more. Uh, where well, you put that all together and things can drop in a tearing hurry. And that's what we saw. But as I emailed my students in the middle of the crisis, I said, look, it's probably going to keep dropping because of trend following. But understand this, when it turns around and starts to come back up, it's going to come back up in a hurry too, because you're going to get the trend followers joining together with the people who are the value investors who say, oh, it's cheap. We should buy because it's a bargain now. And sure enough, that's what happened. And we saw things um, come back really fast. Now, 
here's a question, why did it come back at all? In other words, why didn't it just go down and then stay down? After all, if there was, you know, it's, it, it's not like we came up with a cure or anything like that. So it's not like there was some obvious reason for people to say everything's fine now, uh, or so it would seem. But there actually is a very powerful reason uh, to explain the return. And look, there, there are a number of theories. I mean, there's definitely people who will tell you, oh, well, you have all these people who are home from their work and, so they, and, they, and they don't have any sports to watch. So they just started trading on Robinhood and buying stuff at crazy prices. And there probably is a little of that going on. But the more important factor is the Federal Reserve dropping interest rates, okay? This has been hugely understated in media reports on what's happened in markets. It's actually incredible to read. Um, if, you, um, if you're familiar with the concept, well, here's a useful fact to think about. Um, United States Treasury bonds are up 25% this year, okay? If you bought bonds at the beginning of the year, bought them on December 31st, you've made about 25%, all right? And that is purely because of the Federal Reserve buying bonds and pushing prices of bonds up, okay? Now, if you think about what a stock is, a stock is a risky bond, essentially. In other words, there is one risk associated with US Treasury bonds, and you know you're gonna get paid, but you have, you're holding a long-term asset. And so if interest rates move, you'll, you could make or lose money depending on whether interest rates go down or up. Um, with a stock, you have two sources of risk. You have that same interest rate risk, that same discounted cash flow effect, where if the interest rate goes from 2% to 1%, then the value of, some, of money that you get 30, 50, 80 years in the future drops dramatically, right? And you can compute this on a calculator very quickly, right? If you say, somebody's going to give me a $100 dividend 80 years from now, what's it worth today? Well, at 0% interest, it's worth $100. At 1% interest, um, but you, you, it's worth about $50. And at 2% interest, it's worth about $25. It has an enormous, enormous impact when you have money coming in the distant future if interest rates move. And the Fed made that happen. They said, we're going to buy bonds and we're going to push the interest rate down, which is to say push bond prices up 25%. And that 25% hit to bond prices, affect, or I should say positive hit, right, bump to stock prices, affect, oh, sorry, to bond prices, affects stocks too. It pushes stocks up in the same direction and to an even greater extent because a 30-year bond, you're getting your money in regular intervals over the next 30 years as you get the coupons. But with a stock, you get your money over the course of hundreds of years. So in fact, uh, there's a good case to be made that the duration of the stock market, the amount of time it takes to get your money, is twice as long as bonds. And so think of it this way. If the stock market went from 3,000 to 2,000 because of bad economic news, the Fed caused it to go from 2,000 back up to 3,000 because of the interest rate news. And it counterbalanced the effect, okay? And so that Fed action pushed markets back up in a hurry. So that's the good news, right, is, okay, markets are back up where they were. Great, we didn't lose money. But, you know, there's no magic here. You know, if you have a lump in a carpet and you mush down the carpet to get rid of the lump, the lump shows up somewhere else. And where the lump shows up here is in the future expected returns on the stock market. In other words, the earnings that companies are going to make aren't affected substantially by the Fed action. So the companies are going to earn just what they were going to earn before the Fed lowered rates. So if stocks are worth way more today, but the earnings and dividends you're going to receive in the future haven't changed, then the thing that has to change to counterbalance that, the place the lump comes out in the rug, is that the expected returns in the future are lower. Okay, And how much lower? Well. Essentially, a good rule of thumb, as I mentioned, is that stocks return the return on bonds plus another 3%. Okay, that's historically what we've seen is stocks outperform long term bonds, not, not you know, cash, but long term bonds by about 3% a year. And long term bonds are only paying like 1.4%. So you add three to that and you get 4.4% a year returns on stocks, which is pretty ugly. Now, how are you going to remember historically stocks have returned something like, you know, 11 or 12 percent a year, right? A much, much higher number. So um, most of you are familiar with the rule of 70 or rule of 72. It's a very handy tool for doing financial analysis in your head. What it said is um, if you want to double your money, you can do that by making one percent a year for 72 years or two percent a year for 36 years or 6% a year for 12 years, or 9% a year for eight years. Sometimes people say rule of 70. These are, these are all consequences of the fact that the natural log of two is approximately 
okay? And so any two numbers where one is the number of years and the other is the interest rate per year, if they multiply to about 70 or 72, uh, then that's how long it takes to double your money. And that's super useful, right? Of course, between 70 and 72, um, you have almost every <clears throat> possible advisor, right? Because 72 divides by, you know, two, three, six, you know, uh, uh, eight, nine, 10, 12, you know, et, et cetera. And then 70 divides by, you know, five and, and 10 and seven. So between them, you get almost any combination. So you tell me how many years and I'll tell you what interest rate you need to double. Or alternatively, you tell me the interest rate. So if stocks return 12% a year, it only takes six years to double your money. At 10% a year, it takes about seven years to double your money. Doubling your money seven every seven years means in your adult lifetime, like from age 20 to 90, you're going to double your money 10 times. And of course, two to the 10th is just over 1,000. So at 10% a year, an adult lifetime is a thousandfold increase from the stock market. But at 5% a year, right, you don't get a thousandfold increase. You get a 32-fold increase. You only get five doublings instead of 10, 30 times your money instead of 1,000. So what we've sort of done is taken a lifetime worth of market returns or a decade's worth of market returns and smushed them into the last two months. And that's what the Fed did. And so it's great that the market's higher, as I say, but the bad news is future expected returns are lower. And that is hugely important for alternatives, right? Because look, if you can make 10 or 12% a year investing in stocks, alternatives have to be pretty fantastic in order to justify more than a modest piece of your portfolio. But if stocks are going to return 4 or 5% a year, which is what we're looking at uh, as we look ahead, then there's a huge, huge role. Arguably, alternatives should be the, the dominant force in your portfolio. Now, look, we don't know whether the way that stocks are going to return 5% a year is by crashing a couple months from now when people see the terrible earnings the companies has and then going up faster after that, or whether they're just going to kind of steadily go up 5% a year. No one can predict the future that accurately. But I can say with pretty, pretty huge confidence that comparing today to 30 years from today, the stock market will be up something like 5% a year uh, over that period. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and that return, again, uh, makes us want to look carefully at other types of investments. Now, let me mention one non-alternative investment quickly because it, it relates to alternatives, and that is small value stocks. Okay, so basically, I've been quoting numbers for the S&P 500 index, which obviously is, is the bulk of the market. Um, here's a good rule of thumb on stock performance over long periods of time on, on types of stocks. Okay, um, big growth stocks. Uh, let's see. Let's say it better. Um, small value stocks perform great. Big value stocks perform good. Big growth stocks perform pretty good. And small growth stocks are terrible, okay? So in other words, small, fast-growing, exciting tech companies and stuff historically have had terrible performance. Now, it's disguised by the fact that a few of them, like Google or Netflix uh, or Amazon, have been spectacularly successful. But even if you average them in with all the other small growth stocks, you get awful performance. At the other end of the spectrum, small value stocks, you know, cruddy, old, dirty industrial companies that are kind of boring, have had fantastic historical performance. And then when you get to big stocks, value's done a little better than growth, but not that much better, right? So big growth stocks have been a good investment and big value maybe a little bit better, but not, not a huge difference there. Okay, so um, why is this important? Well, first of all, you know, it's, it's useful to know uh, that if you're going to buy small stocks, you should buy value stocks rather than growth stocks as a general rule. Okay. Second, it's useful to know that in the last few years, small value stocks have done terribly. Okay. They have not outperformed. In fact, they've underperformed. And um, I'm proud to say that I sort of predicted it in the sense that 20 years ago, I wrote a paper called The Value Spread with my co-authors. And what we showed was that you know, value stocks are stocks with low multiples, like say low PE ratios and things like that. And growth stocks, of course, are, are high flying stocks with high prices and high ratios. Um, what we asked was, well, it sometimes must be the case <clears throat> that the cheap stocks are really cheap. And other times the cheap stocks might only look a little bit cheap compared to expensive stocks. So if the value stocks look really cheap, that we call a wide value spread. And if the value stocks are only a little bit cheap, we call that a narrow value spread. And we hypothesized that when the value spread was wide, when the cheap stuff is super cheap, that would be a great time to buy value. 
And what, that's exactly what we showed had been true historically. This was 20 years ago. And at that time, we were right at the top of the tech boom. And we said, boy, value looks really cheap compared to these high flying growth stocks. This is a great time to buy value. And value had a 15 year phenomenal run, okay? And then value wasn't cheap anymore because it did so well for 15 years, value didn't look very cheap. And sure enough, over the last five years since then, value's done terribly because value just wasn't cheap enough anymore. And a year ago, I thought to myself, I bet value's cheap again, but it turned out not to be true. I mean, value was pretty cheap, but not super cheap a year ago. But now value is super cheap. Small value stocks have gotten absolutely hammered, not only over the last five years, but this year in the crisis. They got brutalized in the first quarter and they've come back, but not that much. They're still way behind. Um, and so the upshot is, based on my research from 20 years ago, which seems to have borne out in the data, what I would say to you is, if you're going to buy stocks, buy small value stocks. Now seems to be the time. Now, I want to be clear. Small value stocks are cheap now because they deserve to be cheap, right? Obviously, it makes sense that companies like Amazon and Apple, which have great products that people can use in a pandemic, are going to be performing better than small value stocks, some of which may go out of business as a result of the COVID and, and, the, and the lockdowns and so forth. It's not that the market isn't right to make small value stocks get cheaper. It's just that what we show is, in general, when the market decides that small value stocks should be really cheap, it just the market goes a little too far with it. It overreacts. And that's sort of the general finding, I think, with value generally is value companies deserve to be cheap, but they just don't deserve to be quite as cheap as they are. And as a result, they outperform. Now, this is super important because private equity tends to buy small value stocks. That's the kind, or I shouldn't say stocks because of course they're buying mostly private companies, but the types of companies that private equity buys are similar to the small low multiple companies that in the public markets would be called small value stocks. So this looks to me like a great time for private equity. The kinds of things that private equity likes to buy are gonna be at very low prices now. Now, in existing private equity funds, they probably did not fully reflect. We don't have the index returns for the first half of the year yet. It takes time for them to compile those numbers. In fact, we don't even have the first quarter index results. But anecdotally, it looks like private equity is going to say they were down sort of 12 to 15% in the first quarter. This, despite the fact that small value stocks were down 38%, okay? The Russell 2000 value index, the RUJ, was down 38%. And, and note that private equity is levered. So probably private equity understated how hard they got hit in Q1. Um, and in Q2, when, they came, would have, when the value of their holdings would have come back, they probably understated how much it came back. Nevertheless, it's likely that a lot of private equity uh, positions are marked at a value somewhat higher than, the, than, than what they're really worth today, given what's happened in markets. But new private equity, new deals going forward, um, uh, it's a super juicy time for those firms to be out looking for great opportunities. And I think uh, that they will find great opportunities and, and great investments in private equity. Now, what about hedge funds? Well, hedge funds are interesting in that if you look at the last couple crashes, you know, uh, the, there's only been these three crashes since the hedge fund industry became meaningful in size in the 1990s. In 2000, in the tech wreck, hedge funds did phenomenally. They killed it. Basically, the market was down 50% peak to trough and hedge funds approximately broke even in that, right? So they saved investors a fortune who invested in hedge funds rather than having all their money um, in the market. Um, on the flip side, in the 2008 crash, um, the market was down about 37% for the year 2008. Um, hedge funds typically have about a 50% exposure or beta to the market so that you would have expected them to be down about 18. And they were probably down a little more than that. So if anything, the hedge funds slightly underperformed. They didn't horribly underperform, but they underperformed by a little. Now, in the first quarter of this year, I haven't got all the detailed numbers yet, but it looks like hedge funds did a good job. It looks like they outperformed a reasonable benchmark in Q1. And the key question will be in Q2 with the snapback, were hedge funds smart enough to be buying at the bottom and put themselves in a position to benefit from the snapback, or didn't they? In 2008, hedge funds waited too long to get back in the markets after they hit bottom and they missed out on a lot of the snapback over the next few years. And so whether hedge funds are going to look, whether this is going to look like a heroic period like 2000 for hedge funds or like an okay but not great period like 2008, 
um, and really a less than okay period like the 2008 to 2013 period um, depends a lot on whether uh, hedge funds got in in time uh, to participate in that snapback. And we'll have those results over the next couple months as, as we get more uh, reporting. Okay, so I wanna get to questions. So I'll just say one more thing about how you might um, position yourself in the, in the markets. Um, my phone did something funny. So I wanna make sure you can still see me. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, so hopefully you can still see me. So, um, and that is, uh, this is just a general suggestion for, um, for investing in the markets. And that is, um, and that is that, um, uh, is that um, the, there's a general finding that the stocks that tend to outperform on average, I mentioned small value, which I think is a really good opportunity right now. And as a general matter on a risk return basis, um, low beta stocks, low volatility stocks have a tendency to outperform. And so um, an easy way to invest in low volatility stocks, if you just want a sort of quick and dirty way, and I mentioned that um, crashes are times when there's tons of opportunity to find mispriced positions. And that absolutely is the case. But as a general sort of long-term thing to be holding, uh, I recommend um, uh, uh, an investment in, um, in, uh, in the Vanguard. Um, so hang on, I just wanna make sure that I've got, uh, that I still got the video because my, my phone's acting a little, a little strange, forgive me. Okay, so that looks like it's working again. Um, in, in the Vanguard Minimum Volatility Index. So that is the index, that is the Vanguard Index Fund that buys low volatility stocks. And so like, this is really not so much a thing that financial professionals need to obsess over, but like, suppose that your grandmother calls you and says, hey, I've got some money, uh, you know, I got a cash out from my 401k and I, I wanna put the money in the markets, but I don't wanna be like an individual stock trader or anything. What's something good for me to buy? Um, recommend, here's, here's an easy recommendation that, that I think is, is gonna be consistently a solid thing, a solid way to access the markets. V for Vanguard, M N that is so. V, let's let's do it. Um, <clears throat> Victor, Mike, November, Victor, X Ray. Okay, Victor, Mike, November, Victor, X Ray. That is V for v Vanguard, M N for minimum, and V X, which is Wall Street speak for volatility. So the Vanguard Minimum Volatility Fund. There's also an associated ETF. And the beauty is because it's Vanguard, you're going to pay hardly anything in fees. Right, they do such a, and they're super efficient in their investing. And because it's minimum volatility, what you're doing is you're buying the low risk stocks. And here's just a general simple idea for investing. If anybody has their money kind of 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds, I recommend instead having sort of 85% in the Vanguard minimum volatility index and 15% in bonds or 90 and 10. In other words, um, by buying the low risk stocks, you avoid, look, fundamentally, um, bonds just are going to, you know, long-term bonds are paying one and a half percent a year. It's just a terribly, terribly low return. And so by putting more money into stocks, even if they're only going to pay four or five percent, maybe six percent if we're lucky, uh, that's a heck of a lot better than, um, than getting one and a half percent in bonds. And what history shows is that the low risk stocks really do have a lot less volatility than the market as a whole, but their returns are just as good as the market as a whole. And so VMNVX I think is a good way to access the markets quickly. And it's just sort of a useful actionable tip for right now. Um, so that's, uh, that's you know, I think a, a good time for me to stop and just uh, turn to uh, Natalie for questions. Great, thank you so much. That was super interesting. I'm fairly certain that Vanguard is going to see a small spike in traffic after that uh, <laughs> last note there. Um, you got you got to give credit where due, right? When people do a great job, they deserve to get recommended. I mean, I go, I, I I have no connection to Vanguard of any kind whatsoever, other than being you know, other than that I've got retirement funds with them. But uh, you know, they've just consistently done such a good look. Vanguard's run; they don't like being called a nonprofit. But Vanguard, when they make extra money, they pay it out to the investors. Vanguard is owned by Vanguard's investors. It's not owned by 
a you know wealthy family or by stockholders. It's owned by its own investors. So when they when they charge you know if they if they charge you a fee and then there's extra left over after they paid all their staff and everything, they just pay it out as a as a dividend to their shareholders. So that's just a a really great situation. So sorry to interrupt, Mally. Go ahead. No, no, that's great. Um, we did have several questions about various personal investing uh, advice. So that's that's perfect. Um, one question I, I did want to start with, just because the HBS Online audience is pretty international, and we have people from all over the world take our courses and join our events like this. So I did want to say, I just wanted to ask, um, maybe can you talk about any alternative investment opportunities around the world? So developing economies versus developed economies, or yeah. U.S. versus non-U.S., any other regions of note? Yeah, so well, let me say a really big picture point, which is that people often say to me, you know, uh, you know, alpha, of course, is the is the terminology for you know outperformance in in the markets. And what people will say is, look, I don't understand, Randy. Isn't the alpha going away? I mean, every year we get smarter. We have people uh, programming computers to do stuff that they used to have to pay analysts to do. Um, we have uh, more sophisticated financial institutions and more and more money flowing into those financial institutions. Isn't all the available edge in the markets going to go away? If you, Randy, if you tell a story, if you write a paper about a way, like I have a new paper coming out about, about uh, a way of um, investing in the stock market that we think helps beat the market. Once that paper comes out, aren't Wall Streeters going to read that paper and then invest on that strategy? And doesn't it drive the effect out of the market? And the answer is yes. Over time, as new ideas get broadly known, uh, they're driven out of the paper. My friend Jeff Poniff, who's a, a won, the, won the best paper of the year prize recently for an am amazing paper where he tested like 100 different strategies that had been written up in academic research and showed how the effect diminished over time once they were published as Wall Street found out about them. So then you'd think, oh my gosh, there's no money to be made for us in alternative investments. And yet the reverse is true. And the reason the reverse is true is this. If you ask, can we make money doing the same old stuff that people did before? The answer is no. Every year it's going to be harder and harder to make money off of merger arbitrage or convertible arbitrage or macro or, or some of the things we talk about in the alternative investments course, right? Each of those things are still money makers, but a little less next decade than this decade, right? But there's new stuff appearing all the time. And the most important of those is the globalization of markets, right? You know, when I started my career, uh, a person in the West couldn't invest in China, okay? Um, Five years ago, people in the West could invest in China, but they couldn't short stocks in China. So if they found an underpriced stock, they could buy it, but they couldn't make money shorting an overpriced stock. Now there are some ability, there is some ability to short overpriced stocks in China, and that ability is just going to grow over time. <coughs> Five, when I started my career, you couldn't invest at all in Pakistan, and that was true until recently. You still can't short in Pakistan. Stand, but now a well-structured institution can invest in Pakistan. So in other words, as more and more markets come online, new opportunities are created. And I will say that, for example, take some of the simple quant strategies that we discuss in the alternative investments course, value, uh, momentum, short-term reversal. We ran a series of experiments to see how those strategies had performed in the China markets. Now, in the U.S. markets, those strategies still work, but they seem to work much less well than they worked you know, 20 or 40 years ago before they were well known. In China, as of the last we looked, they were still working fantastically well. So in other words, each new market that opens up not only is a place that, might, um, that, that, that enables you to look for opportunities, but some of the specific opportunities that worked in developed markets uh, or in older markets will, start work, will work for a while in new markets until there's enough competition uh, from sophisticated quants to drive those out. Now, it's not just new markets in the sense of globalization, too. It's also new markets in the sense of new financial products. Think about digital assets like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. There are huge, huge opportunities to make money trading in those assets. I don't mean huge in the sense of, oh, if you buy Bitcoin at 10000 you'll double your money in a month, you know, the way people thought a couple of years ago. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. What I mean is there are thousands of these tokens out there and you can trade in and out of them if you have the skills and and frankly like i don't have that expertise i've studied digital assets but i'm not going to tell you which tokens are going to go up next month and which are going to go down but there are people who really do have that expertise and some of them are probably on this webinar and and if you're one of those people you'll have huge opportunity to make money because those are markets that are highly inefficient um, but even when you turn to tr more traditional assets, there are always new derivatives being created. You know, when I was young, there were swaps and there were options. And then somebody said, wait, 
why can't we do an option on swaps? We'll call them swaptions, right? And then that became a market. And then people who were very clever with numbers made a lot of money on swaptions for years. Now there's probably not that much opportunity in swaptions because they've been around for a while, but there's other things coming all the time. And so both from globalization and from increasing ideas and technology, there are always new opportunities to make money. And that's what makes the world of alternatives so exciting because those, all, those new ideas for making money are almost always going to be couched in uh, the language of alternative investments, right? Um, now, over time, something that feels like an alternative investment will start to become, you know, 20 years later, it may be viewed as, a, as more of a traditional investment. That's fine, right? Because there will be new alternatives. And by the time that alternative investment becomes traditional, it's not gonna be that juicy anymore. Great. Um, so we have another question kind of about the economy in general. Um, do you see any potential benefits resulting from the pandemic economy in the future, or even just like lessons we could learn? Well, look, I think the number one benefit of this pandemic, look, on the one hand, it's absolutely awful and horrifying, both in terms of the deaths, the illnesses, uh, and also in terms of the economic impact. So in no way do I want to make light of it, uh, you know, at all. However, I think we all know that it could have been much, much worse. So it's early reports, we're talking about three and 4% death rates per case. Now they're saying it's going to be, uh, you know, of, of, um, of people who are infected, I should say per infection, right? Uh, you know, these subtle distinctions, case fatality rate, infection fatality rate. We never thought we were gonna have to learn about all that stuff, but I guess, so infection fatality rate is per person infected, even if they don't go to the hospital. People thought it might be 3% of them died. Now it's going to be more like a tenth of that, right? Whether it'll be half a percent or a quarter of a percent, we still don't know, but it's going to be much lower, right? People were very worried. Many, you know, influenza type illnesses are, are brutal in their effects on young children, right? Our most vulnerable citizens. Um, instead, this has turned out to be, you know, uh, rel you know, quite mild in terms of most cases, the children. So in, in those regards, we've been very lucky. And I think we all suspect that it's just a matter of time before we have uh, not only are unlucky enough again to have another pandemic, but to have uh, an even more unlucky pandemic, right? One where the death rate is much, much higher. And, 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 and uh, what I think will happen is we'll be much better prepared for it in the same way that, you know, South Korea fought this virus so effectively because they went through SARS and that got them ready for this. So I think that's the number one benefit is more preparedness and, and maybe not just for pandemics, but for other terrible things uh, that could happen in a society. Um, you know, I, I think we're gonna be a little more prepared uh, for disaster, I sure hope so anyway. So that's number one. Number two, I would say uh, there's an old um, uh, joke by, um, uh, uh, by Robert Solow, the Nobel laureate economist from MIT. Uh, he said, you know, uh, you know, the computer revolution is amazing. You can see it everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Now, he said that back in like the 1980s, okay? And his point was compute, everybody's using computers, but you don't see productivity increasing particularly fast. Why is that these computers seem really useful? Well, of course, what it turned out was they were just scratching the surface in the 1980s of what you could do with computers. Um, but it has been a long wait in which we haven't seen the payoff from a lot of the, you know, internet technology, computer technology, smartphone technology, and so on. We've certainly seen some payoff in productivity, but not as much as people expected. And um, I think that we're now seeing some of it. I mean, imagine if this crisis had hit 20 years ago uh, when no, we didn't have smartphones, when we didn't have uh, really, I guess, I guess there was a little bit of a nascent internet 20 years ago, um, but certainly not with anything like the capacity to handle all this, um, you know, teleworking and, and so forth. Um, People have been wondering for 10 years, why don't we have more telemedicine? Well, there just wasn't that urgent a need to make the switch, even though it like would have saved money and so forth. Well, so now what's happening is a lot of things that we thought could be big things are, were being, are being forced on us. We're being forced to see the doctor through our smartphone. And I think what people are going to discover is, hey, this isn't going to work for everything in medicine, but it's going to work for half of it. Half of those doctor visits can be done um, over the phone, and that could be a much more efficient thing. Um, we're going to discover that you know most of the workforce has to go to work every day, but maybe a quarter of the workforce has to go to work um, three days a week, and then maybe a tenth of the workforce has to go to work no days a week, and that could be uh, hugely valuable for society. So I do think we will see 
uh, silver linings to this pandemic. I don't think they'll be, you know, substantial enough that we'll be like, wow, I'm glad we had that uh, pandemic, uh, you know, unless, as I say, really something truly awful happens in terms of um, in terms of a future pandemic where we're better prepared for. But um, uh, so, you know, I'm not trying to talk myself into the idea of, oh, we're, we're, I'm glad I'm glad of the pandemic, but um, but I do think there will be some payoffs. Yes. Okay. Um, another question here, do you think that ESG or environmental social governance considerations will drive how investors think about alternative investments after COVID-19? Yeah, so I'm really interested in ESG investing. And in fact, I have um, a, a, a sort of talk and paper I've been working on uh, on the subject. So we're, we're just going to be able to touch on it ever, ever so lightly. But, you know, if uh, if there's, you know, a few hundred of you who, who want to see me talk about ESG investing, everybody, you know, spam uh, Natalie's in inbox. And if there's <laughs> enough demand, uh, maybe she'll uh, maybe she'll set it up because I, I would love to, uh, to to give a talk on on that subject to uh, to a big group. Um, short version is. Um, I think ESG is absolutely going to continue to uh, grow in importance. There are some subtleties from a regulatory perspective. You know, the, the way the rules are written, it says that um, companies uh, that, that like pension funds, for example, are only allowed to account for um, future, um, you know, for, for kind of uh, uh, returns and risk for the plan participants. In other words, because what the regulators are worried about is that you have a pension fund manager who says, well, I'm really concerned with this particular political issue. And so I'm going to invest in stuff that fights in that direction, even though uh, it would lose money for, um, you know, for the retirees who will then have their pensions affected, right? So, so the regulatory pushback has been pretty strong and says, no, you know, everything has to be return and risk driven. Now, of course, you never can really, you can't look into a pension fund manager's brain and see why exactly they chose the investments they did. And so, um, you know, as a result, uh, ESG investing has continued uh, to grow apace. And, you know, I think the G plays a huge role here. In other words, it's obvious that having uh, companies that, that focusing on companies' governance um, could be really important to future investment returns. Um, and so I think it makes sense that investors, you know, take ESG stuff into account, especially on, on the governance side. Now, you know, when you talk about something like the environmental side and you ask like, like I happen to be kind of a climate hawk. I'm very, very concerned about climate change. I think it's already doing huge damage and it's going to do much more. And so um, it's completely understandable to me that a pension fund manager would say, well, I don't want to push climate change forward by investing in, um, you know, in, in uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, fossil fuel companies and, and, and so forth. And that's going to make things worse. Um, but so, you know, there is a legitimate question as to, you know, who, which kinds of money managers uh, are supposed to take that sort of thing into account. Obviously, some money managers are probably saying stuff like, well, um, I believe that the world is finally going to act on climate change in the future. And that's going to limit how much future, how much fossil fuel society is willing to burn. And therefore, I don't want to invest in fossil fuel companies. So, you know, there's some subtleties there. I'll add one more thing, which is, I would like to see, and this is kind of the, the, the core of the, the big talk, so if I never get to give it, at least you'll get the, the biggest point. I would like to see people think more broadly about the best way to make a difference. Let's say we stick with climate, whereas I say I have this, uh, this, this strong view. Um, it's not obvious to me that uh, if you, if, 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 if all of us uh, want to do something to help the climate, the best way for us to do it is for us to all sell our stock in fossil fuel companies, right? It could be that the opposite is the case, that what we should be doing is buying stock in fossil fuel companies and then using our clout as shareholders to guide them in a direction that's better for the long-term future of the earth, as well as for those companies. Because, you know, let's face it, if, if we all end up, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, melting to death as the temperature spirals away, it's not going to be, uh, that's not going to help anybody's stock price. Um, and so, you know, the notion that the only right way to fight for a cause is, you know, sort of divestiture is, is, is one that I question. And I think it, it may be that we, that uh, engagement is actually a better way to go. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's, that it's obvious that that's the case. I think it's, it's a debatable question and one that I'd love to explore more. Okay, so we have another question from someone who's watching on Zoom right now, and their question is, is there any indication that the pandemic has affected the flow of funds in alternative investments uh, versus public equities? And at this point, do we know which alternative investments seem to be attracting the most money since this pandemic has started? 
I would say it's been hard to close new investors during this period. I mean, you know, it's sort of a joke in, in many of the meetings I'm in, like, you know, who the heck is going to, you know, write, write, a, write a $100 million check over Zoom, so to speak. You know, it's like people, there's a long tradition of saying, I am not putting money with you unless I spend a lot of time in your company. I want three office meetings. I want a dinner. I want to come to your office and, and spend time and see your staff and all that stuff. And so I would say, and, and, and so obviously in theory, that could hurt mutual funds and, and other kinds of long only investments too. But to the extent that the easy default thing to do is for people to, you know, stick money into, into stock and bond funds. Um, if you have a venture capital fund and you're trying to raise money, um, it, you know, it absolutely creates huge challenges. Uh, so first from the perspective of not getting to have that in-person meeting or series of meetings. Second, from the perspective of, um, of people just when they're nervous, they go with what they know. And so to the extent that, you know, obviously there are plenty of investors who are very, very comfortable now with venture, with, with private equity, with hedge funds, but to the extent that there are investors who, um, uh, you know, are, are kind of um, expanding their thinking into new areas, uh, I would say the tendency is, is to say, well, let's wait a little, you know, I mean, this is a problem. If you don't have something that's going to like double over the next month, and, and let's face it, none of us do. Um, then it's awfully easy for people to say, oh, yeah, this, this new interesting thing I was thinking of investing in, um, sure, I'll still probably invest in it, but just not right now. Let's just wait a month and see what happens, right? And by the way, this is what recessions are more broadly, right? If you think about what it means for there to be a recession and why people are worried that COVID is going to lead to a long-term recession, even if it gets resolved relatively quickly, you know, the problem is that Imagine that you run, you know, you have a bunch of, uh, of uh, f facilities, a bunch of factories, and you're thinking you've got three factories and you're thinking of building a fourth one because demand is high for your products. And then COVID hits and so demand falls off and you're just not certain how quickly it's going to come back. It'll probably come back. It'll probably be fine, but you're not sure. So now you were going to build that fourth factory almost for certain you're going to put that, that plan on hold, right? You're going to say, let's not build the fourth factory yet. Let's wait and see how it plays out. But then the thing is, there's a thousand people in a 50 businesses whose job it was to build that factory, right? To pour the concrete, to, buy, to make the machines that were going to go in it, to set up the electrical system and the plumbing, right? And all those people now don't have a job, right? They don't have the opportunity to build your factory. And then uh, they don't go and they were going to buy cars and, and uh, you know, redo their kitchen and do all kinds of other things. And they don't do that stuff because they don't have income coming in. And then the problem is now maybe you really aren't going to have the demand for your product that you thought you were going to have, right? And so, so things can get put off, you know, can, can get postponed. And, and so that's sort of the general recessionary problem. And that problem and, and the money management business sort of in some ways is not an exception. So I think we'll see in the flow of funds that there's, you know, reduced flow into anything that's sort of interesting. Um, and then the hope is that, um, you know, starting, let's say, next year, uh, that, that there will be a catch-up uh, growth in which people say, wow, we, we were uncomfortable putting money into venture funds and hedge funds and stuff for a few months uh, because we wanted to wait and see how things played out. But now, look at our portfolio. It's massively under-allocated to those areas. We need to put a lot of money into those. So, you know, I don't know exactly. I haven't seen the numbers in terms of the flows, and it's a great question. And maybe I'm overestimating the effect. Maybe, in fact, it's it's been pretty normal. I know that the venture people I've talked to said they're still looking at, they're still, you know, doing deals. It's not like they've shut down deals you know, for a few weeks in there. They were kind of shutting down deals. But now um, they say it's, it's coming back strong. Okay. Uh, Rainy, can I ask you just to try and center your camera a little bit? So if you bring the phone just a little bit upwards, there we we're, go. We're, okay. we're missing your now? face right. for a second there. Oh okay, my gosh. Perfect. Sorry about that. All right. No, no, it's great now. Thank you. Yeah, guys, I, I should say, I don't know if, uh, I don't think we mentioned that I, I'm, I'm um, blind. And so I, uh, so I can't sort of see the screen to see if my face is centered. So I'm just kind of trying to guess at it. So Natalie's uh, kind enough to help me out with this. So thank you so much. Looking perfect right now. Um, yeah. I do have an interesting question here that is something we haven't covered yet um, about corporate venture capital. So um, will the pandemic affect corporate venture capital? And um, when looking at that, what are some important metrics uh, to consider for companies that are planning to invest in the future? I think it will affect. I think companies are going to be more cautious uh, on this. 
you know, I think of corporate venture as something where when companies have extra money, uh, they think, um, you know, sort of the theory of finance says if a company gets a windfall, gets a hundred million dollars, well, okay, you know, pay it out to your shareholders, right? But if you're a corporate manager, you can see that you might think to yourself, hmm, is there something interesting I could do with that money? Because if I pay it out to shareholders and then I come up with a great idea later, it may not be uh, a time when I can easily go raise that hundred million. So maybe I should just hold on to it and have it in case I need it, right? And so then the question is, if you're holding on to it, what are the kinds of things you do? Well, you need to invest it, obviously. You aren't going to, I mean, you might literally leave it in cash, but most firms wouldn't. Uh, so they're going to invest it and they could buy stocks and bonds, the kinds of things they buy in their pension fund. But one of the places they might invest it that would be a good place to put it for sending the message to shareholders, hey, we aren't just sitting on this cash because we don't feel like giving it back to you. We have something useful to do with it, would be corporate venture. And to me, I have to say, logically, corporate venture makes all the sense in the world. Because if you have a startup tech company and Intel comes to you and says, we're interested in making a venture investment in your company. And as part of the package, we'll start buying your product. And you can go tell everybody that you have Intel as a major customer. Well, geez, that is a deal that very few entrepreneurs would want to turn down, right? They would have to love that idea of, of getting Intel as a customer, the credibility that brings in everything. So therefore, the venture arm of Intel should have an inside track compared to anybody else in venture. Now, I talked to a friend who studied this, and he said that historically, the performance of corporate venture is not as impressive as the story I just told would suggest. Like it's done fine, but it hasn't done great, which kind of would have been my expectation when I first heard about it, you know, back in the 90s. Um, and um, so what I'd say is, the, the, if, if it's done great, you'd say, well, then they're just gonna do it no matter what. Since it's done just okay, I think my take on corporate venture is, if companies are flush, they're gonna do a lot of corporate venture. And if companies aren't feeling flush, it's one of the first things they'll cut back on. And I doubt that many companies are feeling flush, although you know Amazon's probably feeling flush now. I mean, they're definitely you know some of the tech companies have done extremely well through the crisis and may be feeling reasonably flush. So I'm not saying it's all going away, but I think we should expect some reductions there. Uh, and that actually relates a little bit to my next question. Um, so we have a handful of questions coming through about various industries with regard to the pandemic, and um, specifically. So on one hand, mm -hmm. there's companies like health companies and tech companies that seem to have a lot of promise. Other hand, things like uh, the travel industry, which has just been really beleaguered, um, whether it's right. the airlines or, or cruise lines. Um, so do you have any thoughts on any particular industries, markets, or, or types of uh, companies that either have potential or at this point are just kind of not worth the risk? Right. So, you know, if we're talking about, obviously, there's sort of the investment perspective and then there's sort of the career perspective. From the investment perspective, you know, the market is going to get right the direction. In other words, the market's going to recognize, oh, cruise lines are in huge trouble, hotels are in moderate trouble, you know, Amazon's doing a-okay, right? It's going to get that right. Now, is it possible that it's going to drop the cruise lines or that it did drop the cruise lines too far or that it dropped the hotels too far? Absolutely, it's possible. And there may be trading opportunities there. Um, I really try to make it a point not to pretend to know about stuff that I don't know. So like, I have not looked recently um, at, uh, at, at you know, those kind of um, industry valuations to see if I think there's been overreaction. About a month ago, I got an email from a brilliant former student who does security analysis, who, and she wrote me and said, buy Boston Properties, they literally her text message said, buy Boston Properties today. Boston Properties is one of the elite firms uh, that owns high-end commercial real estate. And then she attached a spreadsheet with page after page of analysis, basically saying, sure, it's true, that companies like JP Morgan are gonna be renting less space in the future because they're gonna allow a certain number of people to work from home and so on and so forth. And sure, that's going to affect capitalization rates for these buildings, but you can make really extreme assumptions on that and you will still um, absolutely massively see that this company is, is ridiculously underpriced. She said, buy it now, wait five years and look up and see how much money you made, it's amazing. And the stock in fact, from the very next day, I think it dipped that day. And if I bought it the next day, uh, I would have hit the, I would have gotten the bottom and, and it just took off like a rocket after that. And I don't know where it's trading now relative. I, I suspect it's probably close to double where, where she told me, I think it was at $70. So I don't know if, uh, if somebody wants to um, text Natalie what, where it's trading now, I, I hope I'm remembering the prices right, but it's way up. Um, and, and literally today, another person I know who is 
uh, a really bright guy, but not not a securities analyst. He's a lawyer, but he he sent me a thing saying, "I just got this pitch to buy Boston Properties. What do you think?" Um, and it was very funny to me. I'm like, "Yeah, you're you're a month late, you know." But but that's not. But again, the person who told me to buy it a month ago said, "Hold it for five years." So. That's an example of something where it absolutely there was real legitimate bad news for the industry, um, but it may be that the market you know overreacted to that news and there was a buying opportunity. Um, you know, speaking more broadly, you know, one of the interesting things has been what happened in healthcare. Right, healthcare got absolutely destroyed in terms of their uh, performance during the pandemic, and that seems weird. You think it's a healthcare crisis? They're more needed than ever. But what happened was every elective surgery got shut down. Right. I mean, there were whole wings of hospitals that were closed um, because nobody needed their services. You know, nobody nobody was going in um, to get, you know, hernia surgery, you know, I mean, unless they were truly destroyed. But, you know, they're like, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it two months from now. Right. I had a minor medical issue. Right. I called my doctor. I said, how can we deal with this without me coming in? Right. And um, so um, so healthcare got hit really hard in terms of, you know, kind of uh, uh, revenue and profits during this period. Now, long run, I think we all expect that, you know, this, um, uh, you know, the pandemic is is not going to hurt healthcare and may, may even help it. Um, so, you know, I don't have any great stock market industry predictions to make right now. I have to be, I have to be honest, but I will make a comment about industries that's related to my comments about small value stocks from earlier. And that is, I have an old paper that has worn really well uh, about industries and value investing. We look to see whether the reason value investing works is that the value industries outperform. In other words, you know, when I talked about value earlier, I said, you know, think of like tech companies and, and uh, other exciting high flying companies as being uh, the growth companies. And then value stocks are, are more, you know, dirty old industrial companies. But even though I said that, uh, the truth is that's not a good way to do value investing. It turns out value industries only have slightly higher returns than growth industries. The edge in value is in each industry. Buy the value stocks and short, or at least don't buy the growthy stocks, right? And so that means, yeah, in the chemical and industrial industry, but also in software, in healthcare, um, you know, in in high tech, um, in all those industries, if you, you know, buy the less expensive companies that have high cash flow uh, and high payout. Um, and you buy and you, and you don't buy the companies that are kind of reinvesting all the money because they say they're going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, that has led to better uh, historical performance, and I suspect it will again in the future. So we have uh, time for one more question. So I'm going to end on one that came through via Zoom a couple minutes ago. And that question is, uh, what impact do the stimulus packages, either from U.S. or Europe or both, have on investment strategies going forward? And how, how might that affect it? Yeah, so um, I have strong feelings on this. I'm glad you asked. Um, this uh, this stimulus uh, money is uh, is hugely necessary, um, and I'm very concerned about what's likely to happen in the U.S. because um, <clears throat> you know there's sort of a there's sort of an interesting political point here. And you know, as a general rule, it's not a good idea to talk about politics. You're guaranteed to irritate half the people. But but I, this this point happens to have something for everyone. So I'll, so I'll say it. So here's what I feel like we now know, and, and I'll focus on, on the US here. Uh, I, I can't swear whether things are similar in Europe, although when you see the logic of it, I bet it applies in a lot of places around the world. Um, when, um, uh, on the one hand, Democrats in the US are more comfortable with big spending than Republicans are. And as a result of that, we get much bigger spending when the president is a Republican, right? So that seems counterintuitive, right? If the Democrats are the big spenders, why do we get more spending with a Republican president, right? But first of all, let me just say empirically, it is stupendously powerful, the fact. If you look at our last, whatever, 30 years worth of presidents, you will see it is, um, there's an absolute sorting. We've basically seen the biggest spending increases under, uh, under Trump and George W. Bush, uh, the next biggest spending increases under Reagan uh, and H.W. Bush, and then the lowest spending increases under Clinton and Obama. And you can adjust for inflation and population, everything else, and those are, those are very, very uh, powerful effects. So then you say, well, that's backwards, right? Because the Democrats are the ones who like spending better. But the way to think of it is this, that when, they, when there's a Democratic president, the Republicans in Congress will block spending. 
right? And so you don't get that much spending increase. But when the Republican is a president, the Republicans in Congress don't block spending because they want to support the causes of their president. And the Democrats in Congress don't block spending either because the Democrats aren't that anti-spending. <laughs> so what you have is everybody on board with spending when the Republicans are president, where, is president, whereas you have a blocking power when the Democrats are. So, all right, what's going on now? Right now, like, you know, whatever, my view on spending is some spending's good, some spending's bad. I don't have general feelings about, you know, spending being good or bad, it's, it's specific. But, but we all know the way spending should work broadly across the economic cycle. Um, what you need to do is have spending when you are in a, the bad part, when you're in a recession or in a financial or economic crisis, you need to spend to keep things afloat. Otherwise you fall towards depression territory, right? And when things are going great, that's when you should have less, you should run you know, surpluses or much lower deficits and spend less because the economy is generating plenty of energy on its own. It doesn't need government support. Right now, America, like most countries, tends to do the opposite. When things are going great, we're like, oh, things are great. We can spend a lot. And when things are going bad, we're like, oh, things are going bad. We can't afford to spend. And it's the reverse of what we should do. OK, so why am I worried? So the point is, we did the right thing in this crisis, which is there was a huge problem and we needed to spend money, A, as disaster relief for all the people affected by it, but B, also to prop up the economy so you didn't have millions of business. I mean, obviously we're gonna have plenty of business shutdowns, but to mitigate the disaster of potentially huge business shutdowns. So we've done the right thing, okay? But the worry is that we may not continue to do the right thing after the election. In other words, it's, it's pretty likely uh, given current polling, there's at least, you know, there's probably a better than 50% chance that uh, Joe Biden, the Democrat, will win the election. And then if 2009, if the last of the global financial crisis is anything to go by, we should probably expect um, that Republicans will block spending at that point, right? They won't be, they won't be supportive of spending. And that's where you could run into a really deeply dire financial situation. And so what ought to happen now is that the Congress should make a deal that says, we're going to keep spending and keep the stimulus going until things are recovered and are doing okay on their own, regardless of who's the president, right? Um, and uh, and I hope that that's the 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 deal that gets made. But uh, history doesn't make me confident that that's definitely going to happen. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we are at time. Uh, we're so we're going to wrap up. But I just wanted to say, Professor Cohen, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insights. And everyone who's joined us, thank you for spending your time with us as well. Um, and also for all of your excellent thank you. questions. Um, Thanks, everyone. <laughs> if you're interested in learning more or registering for our Alternative Investments course, please check out our website. It's online.hbs.edu. And there you can find more information about course dates, the syllabus, and anything else you might need. Um, and so I just want to say thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>